Okay, so welcome everybody to this uh, uh, session on left government. This is our sixth educational in the series of the Irish Satan Revolution uh, on the book by James O'Toole. This has been organised um, by Rebel Telly and the Red Network. Um, so this session is on uh, left government. We, James will be talking for about 20 minutes. The talk will be recorded for our YouTube series and um, then uh, we'll have some discussion with questions and answers afterwards, but that won't be uh, recorded. Um, and if anyone has uh, is interested in finding out more about the Red Network or getting involved, you can uh, go to our website on rednetwork.ie. OK, so I'll uh, I'll get you to start, James. Yeah, I suppose so. so this session is really bringing up to date a lot of the things we've been talking about over the last few weeks. I mean, we've been talking about how the Irish state was formed as a counter revolutionary response to the uh, Irish Revolution. That from 1918 to 1923, there was, you know, mass strikes and protests by working class people, including general strikes and uh, the Limerick Soviet, where workers took over Limerick, the running of Limerick for, for two months. And that uh, as James Connolly wanted, he wanted the working class to take a lead in the war of independence and, you know, for the outcome of independence, not only to be uh, the removal of the empire and Connolly wanted us to resist partition, the partition of the country, he thought was very um, uh, important. But he also wanted the culmination of the fight against empire to be a fight for socialism, that we would, you know, set the working class up after they'd removed the empire to uh, build a, a socialist Ireland where the, the people could democratically control uh, their own wealth and the, the wealth that they produce was under democratic uh, control. But far from it being the case that people like Connolly came out uh, on top of the War of Independence, I mean, Connolly had already been uh, uh, murdered by uh, the British forces after 1916. It was posh people like, you know, Kevin O'Higgins, William Cosgrave, you know, it was these kind of people who, uh, after the War of Independence, they understood that the working class had been a handy, uh, helpful little reserve army to help them get rid of the empire, but they wanted to push the working class back into their box. And they did that with brutal state repression, with, uh, you know, uh, the adoption of British laws. You know, they, they whole scale adopted uh, all the laws, uh, 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 British laws, uh, to build a state machine that was a replica of the a British state that occupied uh, in, in, in Ireland. Uh, and they did that to protect the tiny little elite, a tiny golden circle. And so, in a way, if we're going to talk about left government, there's two things we kind of have to reconcile. On the one hand, we have our uh, historical analysis and our awareness uh, of where the Irish state came from. If the Irish state is a machine that was built to hold working class people down, in the post-revolutionary period. And that machine was strengthened and reinforced over the decades. If that's the nature of the Irish state, as Connolly said, uh, as Connolly rightly said, uh, all governments under capitalism are but committees of the rich to oversee the affairs of the capitalist class. In other words, that governments are made to serve, the political elite is made to serve the economic elite that people like Dennis O'Brien and Larry Goodman, the billionaires, have ways and means by which they get the political elite to serve their interests. That's what Connolly said. And our historical analysis confirms that. I mean, we spoke in one of the previous sessions about the uh, legacy of corruption, the ongoing corruption in the Irish state and the links between the political elite and the economic elite that, you know, it's great to get left wingers elected to parliament, but you know you can elect a load of people to parliament, and the rich still control the senior judiciary. They still control the civil service. They still control the head of the police. They still control the courts. They have the constitution that defends their private property, and they still control the economy. You know, as I said in one of the previous sessions, it's Dennis O'Brien's Brian's three billion isn't just a lot of money, it's also in itself inherently anti-democratic because he commands the labour of, or can command the labour of so many people. And commanding the labour of so many people makes you so important to the uh, economy of the entire island that the political elite will do uh, what you say. So we have to reconcile that understanding of the Irish state. Our historical analysis, you know, uh, smart working class socialists like James Connolly, the analysis that we get from history and from Connolly, that it's a machine for holding us down. 
with the fact that we've never had a left government in Ireland. And we should be immensely excited about the fact that a left government would damage the establishment. A left government would scare the bejesus out of Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. Can you imagine that uh, uh, a Sinn Féin-led government, a party that have been demonised as terrorists, you know, uh, a party that's despised by the independent, by, by the newspapers, by the mainstream media, uh, that, that such a party leading a government would have the uh, establishment, the senior civil servants, the judges, you know, all the ghouls and goblins of the ruling class would be foaming at the mouth against such a government. And surely uh, any socialists, whatever our criticisms of Sinn Féin in terms of their nationalist politics or whatever, you know, you have to be excited at the prospect of uh, provoking such a response from the ruling class of so scaring, uh, uh, so scaring the ruling class. But I think if we both understand how excited people are uh, about the prospect of Ireland's first left, left government, but also then understand the nature of the Irish state, the history of the Irish state and what the Irish state is, well, then we have to try and both engage with people's desire for a left government and engage with the desire for change. But we also have to be honest with people that the process of change won't be won with the mere election of a left government. If Connolly is right and governments under capitalist society are but committees of the rich for managing affairs of the rich, if Connolly is right and if our understanding of the origins of the Irish state is correct, that it's a counter-revolutionary machine, a machine built to hold us down and protect the golden circle. If that is right, and we know that it's right because we've seen uh, that confirmed by the Gardaí action against the Debenhams workers, you know, you see the state intervene on behalf of the rich and against workers uh, all the time. If that is right, well then surely we have a duty to try and convince working class people that left government by itself may damage the ruling class, but it's not going to finish them off. And unless we take on Irish capitalism, unless we take on the domination of our housing stock by vulture funds and landlords, unless we take on the outsourcing and privatisation that's ongoing in our health service, unless we take, as Connolly said, the wealth of the nation back into the hands of the people who produce that wealth, then uh, any reforms that are won by a left government can be pushed back. Uh, and I know Ireland doesn't have an experience of a left government, but countries like Sweden have experiences uh, of the left in government. And there, you know, there have been periods, uh, for example, the post-war boom. From the 1940s to the 1970s, uh, capitalism uh, uh, went through a, a huge period of growth. It's called the golden age. Although the golden age of capitalism was fed by the reconstruction after World War II. So it's a pretty obscene system that, you know, one of its greatest periods of growth actually came from the horrors of uh, World War II and the, the uh, necessity of rebuilding after the war. But during the post-war boom, basically capitalism, you know, the bosses, the capitalists, the rich were making so much in terms of profits that they felt that they could buy workers off with reforms. You know, so in Sweden, the Swedish rich were like, well, you know what, we'll keep the workers quiet by building a million houses. But when the post-war boom uh, collapsed, you know, in 1973, you had the oil crisis and, you know, a world uh, economic crisis, uh, you know, profit rates started to collapse for the capitalists. They didn't have enough money to buy the workers off and keep their profits up. And they'll always choose their profits, their own pockets over everything else. Uh, and so that began the period of what we call neoliberalism, where the rich decided well, screw this, we're not financing welfare supports for poor workers, we're not financing supports for disabled people, we're going on the attack to defend our profits. And from that point on, from the 1970s on, you know, what we call the neoliberal period, it's been even more difficult to win reforms from a wealthy class, from, from the boss class, who are out to defend their own profits by, by any means necessary. They'll do whatever it takes to, to defend their own profits. And so in countries like Sweden, you've seen an erosion of the housing stock, an erosion of reforms, you know, outsourcing and privatisation. Obviously, those things haven't been uh, to the extent that they were in Ireland, because, you know, in Ireland, we never w won a vast amount of reforms like the Swedish working class did. We never, we never had these things in the first place to erode them. Uh, so we're further down the neoliberal path 
but uh, even in places like Sweden, as long as capitalism exists, you can win a reform, say, for example, on health. And then they'll take, you know, housing, the housing stock, they'll privatize the housing stock, and then you win some houses, and then they outsource the health service. There's a multi-front battle going on all day, every day, between the working class and the ruling class, between working class people and the billionaires and millionaires. Uh, and that battle goes on day in, day out, no matter who's elected to parliament. Uh, and if you forget that that battle is going on day in and day out, if you forget for one second that that battle uh, is going on day in, day out. And neoliberalism, you know, those neoliberal, that neoliberal attack on the working class is going in day in and day out. They'll take back any gains we made over previous uh, decades. They'll, they'll, take them, they'll take them back. So at the same time as being aware that a left government and the election of a left government would be a huge blow to the establishment. And so it's something we all want to see. By itself, that doesn't change the nature of uh, uh, the neoliberal economy and the neoliberal attack on working class people. And very quickly, as we saw with the election of Syriza in Greece, the, uh, those who run the system will ask such a government to pick a side. Uh, and Syriza, you know, when threatened by the bureaucrats who run the neoliberal EU, and I think we have to be honest about what the EU did to Greece. You know, the EU likes to present itself as, as humanitarian. And I think the uh, rotten politics of the Tories in Britain and the rotten politics of racists like Nigel Farage uh, ha often has made people on the left over the last few years very cautious about uh, legitimate criticism of the EU because you're afraid of being associated with the uh, right and the far right. But I think that there is a legitimate far left crit criticism of the EU which is about how the EU treaties enshrine neoliberal politics and neoliberal policies. And so uh, an Irish left government would be immediately asked by the bureaucrats running the EU, just as the Greeks were asked, are you going to oblige by EU treaties that Ireland has signed up to? And if that government says yes, then that government cannot deliver social housing. I don't care how good the people who compose that government claim to be or how left wing they claim to be. If they stick to the letter of the fiscal treaty and uh, previous EU treaties, which, uh, which oblige governments to stick to a certain fiscal uh, constraints, then you cannot deliver, you cannot do what's necessary uh, to house every person in this country. And I think when faced with those kind of choices, you have to put the people first. You know, a piece of paper signed between Ireland and the EU is secondary to the interests of a, a child who has to eat outside the GPO on a piece of cardboard. That child comes first before any piece of paper. Uh, and, but that requires uh, putting it up to the system. It requires uh, challenging uh, the system. So if you agree that you're gonna stick by those constraints, then you're not going to, you're not going to deliver uh, and you're just going to demoralize uh, people. But on a deeper level, I think that if you just see the strategy of the left is to uh, get into government and then we'll win some reforms. As I said, first of all, we're in a very different context to the context within which, say, for example, the Swedish working class won reforms. We are not in a post-war boom. We're not in a period where capitalism is healthy enough to reconcile giving working class people reforms and keeping their profits up. And so they will choose their profits and they'll go to war with us to keep their uh, profits up. So the context is very, very different to the context within which it was easy to win uh, reforms. But on a deeper level, the state, as Connolly said, is a committee for managing the affairs of the ruling class. And I think that was evident during the election now, in terms of understanding how the state machine works uh, and how the rich can retreat from parliament and allow the left to make gains in parliament, but still keep control of the machine. A lot of people think that having a parliamentary majority itself is control of the machine, rather than understanding how the state machine actually works. So I want to talk now a little bit about how the state machine works. And I think this was illustrated during the election last year, where a delegation from Sinn Féin, including uh, Owen O'Brien and a few others, they went into the department of the Taoiseach and they had to meet uh, Martin Fraser, who's the most senior civil servant in the government. Now you think about it, right? The people of Ireland, are on the verge of electing a new government. Sinn Féin have got enough votes. 
that they are going in to meet the senior civil servants just in case you know they're the they're, they're the ones who uh, uh, have to make the new government but you know the prospect that would have been a left government or a left minority government now martin fraser is a neoliberal he was responsible for a lot of the public sector cuts during the years of austerity so this man is an out and out neoliberal who uses his position in the civil service and has used his positions in the civil service to help the austerity drive kick working class people so in other words throughout successive governments over the last few years this civil servant has been in place no matter who we elect these people remain in place if you don't have a strategy for tackling that fact and tackling the machine composed of these uh, neoliberal uh, senior civil servants and members of the ruling class that populate the state machine, then you're not understanding uh, how the machine works and how we can actually deliver uh, change and substantial change in the lives of ordinary people across this country. So Sinn Féin go in with their election manifesto, which is a list of promises that you make to the people during an election. And Martin Fraser sits down and he negotiates with you how to turn that manifesto into a programme for government. In other words, every single government, even if it's a government of only left TDs, is a coalition with the right. I'll say that again. Even if there isn't a single member of Fianna Fáil, a single member of Fianna Gael in your government, it is a coalition with the right. You might go, how does that make sense? Because your government and your programme for government always has to constitutionally has to be agreed with the senior civil servants. They act as a filter through which anything that goes beyond the constitution is filtered out. So the constitution defends the right to private property. And by private property, we don't mean like your jewellery box or the bike that's sitting, you know, uh, on your fence in your garden. They don't mean the private property of individuals. By private property, the constitution means ownership of factories, ownership of offices, ownership of billions, ownership of vast wealth. The wealth of the rich, which we have to challenge, the fact that they control the wealth. If we want to house every child in this country, we have to challenge that wealth, right? But the constitution defends their control over that wealth. A constitution written by McQuaid and de Valera. But if the only way we're going to house everyone is to challenge that constitution, and the constitution is the basis of the formation of every government, and right-wing neoliberal civil servants will tell you whether or not your program for government is constitutional, well then every government under capitalism is a coalition, a coalition with those right-wing civil servants. So people seem to think that if you have a left government, the left are in control. No, the left are dominating parliament, but Parliament is the front stage area. The lighting manager and the set director and the overall director of the show, still the capitalists. It's still in the hands of the capitalists. And that's the state machine. So they control the state machine, the machine that lies behind Parliament. They control that through their control of uh, what's constitutional, uh, the, the high court judges who defend the constitution. So any move you make to say, for example, build housing, that's deemed an attack on private property will be declared unconstitutional. They have the Senate, which is an upper house, which is an imitation of the House of Lords in Britain, which is actually anti-democratic because it's the whole idea that the votes of the people uh, will sometimes make unenlightened decisions and you need an upper house to be a check on the plebs. The whole idea of the House of Lords is that the House of Commons might, might do the wrong thing or might attack private property. Uh, and so you need uh, a higher house to uh, be a check on them. So there's all these checks and balances and means by which the rich make sure they stay rich. I mean, I think someone uh, cynical once said, if voting could change the system, they'd abolish it. And I think that's very true. And actually, since the austerity years, since 2008 and since the bank bailout, when it was revealed to all of us that parties like Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael served the rich, their votes started to decline and people started to vote for parties like Sinn Féin and started to vote for radical left parties, for socialist parties, like people before profit. And what happens? The rich come along with agreements like TTIP and CETA which start to give corporations more power and start to pull uh, decision-making further and further from ordinary people and from working-class people. So there you see it. When our votes start to impact 
on the fate of the rich. They start withdrawing democracy. Whatever little token bit of democracy they give us, they start to withdraw it. So the system is only democratic in appearance. And I think we have to understand that. So the final thing I wanted to say is that Connolly was right. The Irish state is a machine built to defend the ruling class. Every government is a committee of the rich for managing the affairs of the rich. And socialists need to be for more thoroughgoing change. I think that a left government would put it up to the rich, but it's going to be struggles on the streets and in the workplaces that can stay the hand of the ruling class. And I think a left government that adapts to the system could lead to mass demoralization. And I think that's why we need to push socialist politics, because socialists understand that we need a different machine. We need a different way of running things, that we need to dismantle a machine that oppresses us and replace it with democratic assemblies, with town hall meetings, with workplace assemblies, with industry, industry wide assemblies of working class people that start to involve themselves in the decision in the decisions that affect them that we bring the great wealth of capitalists, the great wealth of people like Dennis O'Brien under democratic control. As Connolly said uh, to those who accuse us of wanting to steal the money of the rich, Connolly said socialists are part of the great anti-theft movement. People like Dennis O'Brien only made their billions by stealing public funds, by bribing politicians and by exploiting the labour of workers day in and day out. So we are the great anti-theft movement. We want to put the money back in the hands of those who produce the money. And that is anti-theft. That is about giving the money back to those who've actually produced it and taking it from those who've stolen it. And I think that that's the politics, uh, the politics we need. A politics that's about winning a left government in Ireland, but going beyond left government, because we won't win change until we actually fight for a socialist government. And a socialist government would be very different to a committee of the rich manning the affairs of the rich. A socialist government would be a government of the people for the people, a government made up of the people themselves. And I think that that's worth fighting for. It's a vision worth fighting for. Thanks uh, very much, James, uh, for that. And thanks everyone uh, again for, for coming uh, today. This has uh, been a really good uh, educational series and this is the last uh, session here today. So. Um, thanks everyone on the YouTube channel who've been watching uh, as well and uh, subscribe to our channel if you haven't uh, already. Um, 